A father is like none other. We reflect back on how they have been an important part of our lives. It's in the embarrassing things, like the dad jokes, and in the unsung things, like showing up. It's in the expected things, like providing for the family, and in the unexpected things, like learning to French braid. Today, we passionately celebrate these fathers and the men who took up the fatherly role, where other men failed or sadly passed on to glory. You have modeled for us what real men should be. And because of you, we have a more wholesome view of our Father in Heaven. Thank you, Dad. Thank you, Dad. And that is one of the roles of Father, all those things I mentioned, but to reveal the heart of the Heavenly Father to children, and I hope your dad did that. And if not, we as a community get to do that to the next generation. So we are excited to, yeah, I'm going to do something special for our fathers. If you're a father, raise your hand. Mark's got a little treat for you, a little something special. And then for the men who are not fathers, um, Mark has something a little bit for you later, right? Are you handing out later? Oh, okay. He'll do the, he'll do the men who are not fathers. So fathers, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Oh, Salam, you are not a father. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, Scott. Scott's running our AV. Give it up for Scott. <laughs> okay, now he's got, he's got some cookies for the men who are not fathers. So we just want to honor you and thank you. So we're doing something a little special today. So you're still going to hear from Mark at the end, but we're going to take a moment to hear each other's stories, which I think is so interesting and fascinating. It connects us with one another, helps us know how to pray for one another. So we're going to hear from some of you are going to come up and give tributes to either a father, a father figure, a son who's a father, somebody in your life who was a father. And then I've got some things I'm going to read from people who are not in our living room, but maybe are on Zoom and would like uh, me to read something to people in our, our midst. So the first person coming up, I just want to say there are a lot of inspiring father stories. You probably heard them either reading books or on video on YouTube. Uh, one that comes to my mind immediately is the, the Hoyt team where the, the son is a paraplegic and the father began running because he, the, the one thing that helped the, his son to feel joy, he couldn't really even communicate, was when he, he ran, when his father was pushing him in the, um, I guess, the, whatever the, the wheelchair is that, that can, can go really fast in races. So he's, his dad, who's not a runner, started running marathons. And, oh my gosh, they've run like 30 plus marathons and inspired a whole organization called Team Hoyt. And there's a Team Hoyt right here in San Diego. And at the last marathon that Mark ran, he ran the half um, San Diego Rock and Roll Marathon, there were, I think, 14 paraplegics that were being pushed by moms and dads that were running them through. And it's just so inspiring. So you hear stories like that, and I could have shared a couple of those. But I wanted to share our community stories because they're equally important, maybe not as dramatic, but they're just as important, right? And we're going to conclude the tributes with some poetry written by um, Jim Ellis, our friend here, which, by the way, um, we didn't actually meet him at the farmer's market. We, we kind of spent more time getting to know them, but Mark and Jim were on the Heal Zone together, which is was a Kaiser grant given to Lemon Grove to help improve healthy, eating, active, living. Heal, H-E-A-L. And that's kind of where they became friends. They realized they had running in common. And if you run one or two races together, just one. So last year, Jim invited Mark to run the Race for Autism 5K in Balboa Park. So they ran that together. So they've got that running bond together, right? Right, Jim? <laughs> He's like, yep. <laughs> and oh, in Cornhole. That's right. So at the Farmer's Market, indeed, that's where I think I got to know Jennifer a little bit more. I don't think I knew you before that. And they, uh, Jim would come pl play Cornhole while Jennifer was buying the organic vegetables. And she's a vegan, so we have that in common. So it's pretty cool. Um, so great to have you both here. So our first person that's going to share just 
a little bit about her son and son-in-law. Tina is going to come back up here. Come on up, Tina Merlo. It seems like I shouldn't need notes about my son and son-in-law, but they are the ones that I really want to give respect to today. And I'm just going to give you a little glimpse of each one of them. My son-in-law comes from a, a Christian home ever since he was little. And when he married my daughter, they continued having this Christian home. They're very strong Christians. It's, it's beautiful to see. And this is kind of a side note, but it seems like Satan likes to attack their family more than some of the others. But that is what it is. Their strength is in staying together. Um, now, his name is Keith. He always wants to go wherever. He has two daughters, he and Monica. Um, wherever they go, Keith wants to go with them. He goes, he enjoys being with them. Right now, he's painting a bedroom for his one daughter, Shay. His other daughter sings and plays guitar around San Diego, and he goes to all of her gigs. He's very, very active, and there's been times when he's been emotional about maybe his kids or something, and he can't help but, but cry. Um, you, you can see it, and he holds it in, but it's beautiful. It's a, it's a beautiful marriage that I see that my daughter and my son-in-law are in, and I just treasure them so much. And I just wanted to share Keith with you just for a moment. My son, who is John, these are totally two different men. <laughs> But John has um, extensive Bible knowledge. When I thought of that today, I thought, oh my gosh, why didn't I have him get on Zoom on Saturday with Lee? Because he, likes, he knows a lot of the word and he likes to question a lot of it. And I'm going to have to get a hold of him. And he has a fantastic sense of humor. He has called me, and this is only one example out of many. He's called me and he'll say, Mom, now it's time. I need to know who is my real mother. I mean, he thinks of these, he's really, really quick-witted. And the last thing I really wanted to say, he has two children also. This past year, each of, each of them, one is Danny, one is Delaney, they came to stay with me for a while separately. They're from two different states. It was not planned, but each one of them said, we really thank you for how you raised our dad. He is so good to us, and we appreciate him. They both said it in their own different ways. It was not a, they're, they're not doing this together. It was not. It was like God's blessing to me because they did grow up in a home without a father. So I know what it's like to be mother and father, and it's very difficult. So for him to be a good dad and a good husband now is such a blessing. And they are my, my blessings I wanted to share with you today. That was beautiful. Good job, Mom and Dad. You, give Tina some dad cookies. She was a father. <laughs> All right. Our next um, person that's going to share is Marie. And she's going to get up and share about her father, maybe her grandfather, too. She's got quite a story, so... Uh, welcome, Marie. Uh, my grandfather was a missionary in China. Once upon a time, it was a very long time ago. And um, when I was born, my papa already told me, you are a gift from God for us. And you are a gift from God for your sister and brother and all the people on this earth. You got to love them and be good to them like what God says. So... Papa, when I started to go to school in the 50s, a lot of my friends know that I'm Christian because I don't go out to have fun on weekend. The first thing I have to do is go to church. It's a must for my dad that we have to go to church. So I don't go and hang out with friends. They say, why don't you come and hang out with us? I say, no, I have to go to church. They say, you are a Christian? I say, yes, I'm a Christian. You believe in what? You believe in uh, Mother Mary or who you believe? I said, I believe in God. Only one and only mighty God. That's what I believe in. That's what I've been taught. Because my grandparents were missionaries. So my father followed through. So he raised us. Eight children. I'm the seventh in the family. All about God. 
And then my friend, the first question they asked me, how do you know there is a God, Marie? I said, I know because I'm brought up this way. I'm being taught that way. I go to church. I learn all the knowledge of God in God's Word, in the Bible. And then he said, but you don't see your God, do you? I said, of course I don't see my God because my God is a spiritual God. Okay? So I asked, I asked her, I said, do you, you have a brain? She said, yes, I got a brain. Can you see your brain? <laughs> you can see your brain. I mean, you believe you got a brain. So I don't see my God. I believe I have a God. Okay, coming back to my dad. My dad is a very hardworking man, raised eight children, running away from the communists in China. And I was, my mother was having me in the tummy, and they went on a boat, and they landed in Singapore. Then I was born and raised in Singapore in 1951. So now you know my age now, I can't <laughs> lie. <laughs> okay. My dad is a God-fearing soul. He, he, brought, he raised eight children and taught us how to live in a way that is morally right. That, that is right in the part of fearing God. He said that's the part of being fearing God. He says, then to obey His rules of our religion. That's our religion. That's a Christian religion. That's what the Bible taught us. That's why I sent you to church. So you have to acknowledge there's a God, you know. Uh, he's the creator of heaven and earth. Since I was little, my papa always tell us Bible story. Not any other fairy tale story. Always the Bible. Daddy always read us the Bible and daddy always talk about God. So we kind of automatically as a child, this is the way, it's very common how you teach your children when they are young. Okay, so my dad taught us that way when we were young that we have to be God-fearing and we have to obey God. We have to follow His words and we have to go to church to connect. So that's how we learn. So I am very proud of my religion. Okay, I thank God every day that my dad brought me the right direction, the path. Dad is like making my way, secure my way to heaven to meet him someday. So I feel very good and confident about that and I enjoy going to church until to this day. I enjoy learning about God's Word until this day. I will never stop worshiping God. The last breath, I will still say, I love you, God. His love endures forever. We are very, I'm very grateful and I'm very blessed that I was brought up in the right path. Okay, thank you so much for giving me this chance to talk about my dad. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing part of your life with us. All right, so I'm going to read something from one of our members afar. Ariana, as you know, was part of this church when she was little, like 12, I think is when we first met her. And we've watched her go through ups and downs, and we've watched her have bad relationships, and then finally a good one, and then she got married, and right in our backyard here during COVID, and now she's got two beautiful children. And so um, she wrote something for her father who passed away on the eve of her birthday two years ago. So kind of a, a tough one for her. Today on Father's Day, I honor and celebrate the life of my dad, a man who, whose life was a tapestry of complexities and challenges, but also of love and redemption, Daniel Gomez. My dad and I shared a complicated relationship Anybody relate to that? Um, there were times of difficulty and misunderstandings, yet within these moments, there were also glimpses of deep connection and shared experiences that will remain with me forever. As a young father and gang member, without a father is on his own, my dad faced a world filled with adversity and difficult choices. Yet beyond the struggles and the life he led, there was a man who loved God, loved his family deeply, and wanted the very best for his kids. And despite the path he walked, he taught us valuable lessons about loyalty, resilience, and the importance of quality time and family. My dad also had a softer side. So he was a tough gang member um, when he married um, Ariana's mom. We don't even know half the story. Uh, I think he was up in um, Riverside area. But especially toward the end, latter years of his life, we did see his softer side come out. The moments, my dad had a softer side, the moments when he showed vulnerability and sought to mend his ways. 
These glimpses of his humanity taught us about the power of redemption and the importance of striving to be better while we have the opportunity here on earth. Though my dad was not a perfect man, his imperfections made him real and relatable. He taught us that it's okay to make mistakes, to fall and rise again, and that true strength lies in the ability to keep moving forward. Thank you, Ariana, that was beautiful. And I'm sure he is very honored with that tribute. So now I'm gonna invite up our singer, David, who is just a great uh, musician. He, he can pick up a tune and sing it like he's known it his whole life. Come on over, David. And he's gonna talk about, I don't know what he's gonna talk about, I'll let him tell you, but I did know his dad um, from way back when, when, when he was, um, when David was a little guy. I knew he exactly. So I'm excited to hear uh, David's tribute. I forgot I didn't write anything. But, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, so my dad was also a nerd. Like, he, he uh, I, I don't remember when it was, but at some point in middle school or high school, he, like, he, like, passed out of the class, and so he had to go to the advanced one. And so he took, like, two buses down to the other school and walked in on the first day, and it's all, like, a bunch of Asian kids. And the teacher's like, I think, I think you're in the wrong classroom. I think you want that one. So he goes over to the other one. And then a few minutes later, he comes back, and he's like, nope, this is, this is the one. Um, and, and yeah, so I pick up on like stuff like that, that like even, at, at, even after he's gone, I'll still pick up on stuff like, oh, this is something I'm similar to my dad. And, and I would think <coughs> sometimes I would see him care about stuff that was like, why do you care about this? Like he would, he would come home from work and watch the, the PBS news hour and like watch these debates between people who are like, oh yeah, here's what the, the housing market rates have done. And I'm like, what's wrong with you? You're watching like numbers on a screen. This is not like fun like playing with Legos or anything. <laughs> but now that I'm older, I, like, I understand. Like the reason he cared about the stuff he cared about, he ran for a city council position and his issues were housing, schools, and something else I forgot. But now that I know how like the, the governments work, what the federal one does, does, what the state one does, what the local one does. I'm like, oh, it makes sense for him to have these values and then end up doing these things. So, so I just kind of think, I think our Heavenly Father is like that. Like, he, he knows more than us. He's got a plan. And sometimes we don't understand it, but if we trust it, then things will just make sense later. So yeah. I don't, I don't know who's next, so. <laughs> All right. Thank you, David. Um, his father passed away when he was in high school, so, yeah, so that was, that was very brave of him to get up and talk about his dad, because that's a hard thing, you know, when you look up to a man, his, his man, his dad's name is Mark, and he was a very good man, and so um, he can see that in David, Diana, and Daniel. Okay, so <clears throat> the next one is something I'm going to read from somebody who's not in the audience in the room. And their names are Kathy, Vicki, and Mary. <laughs> so Pastor Lee's daughters, who I don't even know if I've met all three of them. I'm pretty sure I've met one. But I reached out to them and I said, hey, how would you like to write something for your father? A tribute for Father's Day. So you know your girls, and you're not going to be surprised what they wrote. So this is what the three of them came up with together. Ten things we love about our dad. Number one, he's cool, and our nickname for him is him, the only guy in the house. Him. <laughs> three girls and a mother. Him. That's his nickname. Number two, he is a devoted husband and a good daddy. Number three, he is there for us and wants us to succeed. Number four, he's always pleased when we come to him for help or to talk. Somebody get Leah tissue. Um, number five, he's ecstatic when we bring broken things to him to fix them. <laughs> I laughed when I read that one because that's, I can just see Pastor Lee doing that. Number six, he's a good listener, calm, easygoing and extremely patient. 
Can I get an amen on that one? <laughs> We've all experienced that side of Pastor Lee. Enjoys learning new things and is an excellent teacher. And I'm with Tina. I love his Saturday morning Bible studies. I'm always learning and having my mind stretched in multiple different ways. Number seven, enjoys learning new things. Oops, I, I already read that one. Number eight, he loves to talk and learn about the Bible and share it. And that goes right along with his teaching abilities. He's got on our website, if you go to our website and you click on Bible studies, there's over 200 bite-sized Bible studies that are uploaded on the website. They're just like one page, quick read on all kinds of different topics. Single spaced, one page. Thank you, Felicia. He's also got some deeper dives. He, he tackles the hard topics like hell and different things like that. So if you want to read some interesting writings, go out to our website and you can see Pastor Lee's writings there. Okay. Uh, number nine, the deepest lines on his face are from a lifetime of smiling. Oh, I love that. And number 10, his own jokes make him so happy. You just have to smile too. <laughs> We love you, Dad, from Kathy, Vicki, and Mary Logue. Yay. <laughs> All right, so now Marguerite is going to make her way forward. Look at her walking with no walker. Oh, she does have a cane. Oh, she's not going to use her cane. Somebody spot her. By the way, if you're watching on Zoom, Marguerite fell about six, eight weeks ago, something like that. And so she had it's a, frac a fractured sacrum and pelvis, but she's healing, so... Thank you. Okay, um, I don't want to make it seem like my dad was um, perfect because we only got one perfect father, but uh, to me, he was. Uh, just, he was a very simple, uh, you know, ordinary man. He was a country boy. He grew up in a small town in southwest Scotland. And then he moved to Glasgow, the big city, and he met my mom, and um, that's where we grew up. And uh, he just, he worked hard. He supported the family. He loved, he was self-taught in, in botany. He loved to be out in the outdoors, and he had a wonderful garden. When we were little, he used to grow vegetables, and as soon as we, you know, finances were a little bit better, he switched to flowers, and he had a fantastic garden always. You would always know where he would be. He'd be out there digging in the garden. So anyway, when my dad turned 80, um, I wanted to do something special for him, but, you know, gifts, that, when you're 80, you don't really need any more stuff, and... And so anyway, I wrote him a love letter. So I was about 42 when I wrote this. And, uh, well, he really loved it. <laughs> Dad, I love you. I tried to find something to buy for you for your birthday to make a special gift. I tried to pick a card for you, but it did not express properly my feelings for you. Sorry. I thank you for all the time you spent with me and the things you helped me to see. When I was little, you showed me things along our path and explained what they were and how they worked. Although some of the facts you gave me do not remain in my memory, the feelings of sharing and warmth and security that you gave me then have never faded. The stories you told me were magical and the encouragement to read introduced me to a lifelong love of the written word. I don't remember hearing you say I love you to me, but I felt it always. You were always there waiting for me when I came back from a trip, and I knew you would always be there. I still feel that way. Later, when it was time for me to try my wings, you let me go. I thank you for that too. There's no way for me to repay the precious gift you have given me, but I can try to pass it along to my children, and I do. What better legacy can you give than the best part of yourself? I love you, Dad. Somebody help Marguerite back to her chair and hand her a tissue. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right, that brings 
us to me. So um, online is my mom and my stepdad from Colorado. They live in Longmont. Hi, mom and stepdad. Um, my stepdad, I'll just tell you um, one thing from my dad and my stepdad that I've learned. And um, my stepfather took on my mom when I was 16. My sister was 14, and the twins were seven. Four women, plus my mom, five. And he'd been a bachelor for 42 years. Now, is that bravery, or is he? So, funny story, when he met Mark, because I, I went to college two years after they, my mom and stepdad, Ken, were married, and he met Mark, he said, he said, so, young man, he says, um, if you were in my position, and you met Joan and her four daughters, would you have taken them all on? And Mark's like thinking, what's the right answer? What's the right answer? Because, <laughs> you know, he was date, we were just starting to, to date. And um, he's like, yeah. And he goes, no, you wouldn't. <laughs> Nobody would take that on. And uh, he, he started with like emotional mood swings and that time of the month and bras and stuff hanging on curtain rods and all the stuff that comes along with having five women in your house. And he, I think the thing that I saw in Ken was patience, tons and tons of patience. And my sister, my older sister, uh, the sister that's older than the twins, she's younger than me, there are many attributes that we see in our spouses that were in our stepfather, Ken. And so I just say thank you, Ken. Um, both our husbands are very patient. <laughs> thank you for uh, setting that example for us, even though you were only there for a couple years in the end of um, my teenage years, you've made a huge impact. And just knowing that you take care of my mom is, is everything to me. So thank you and happy Father's Day, Ken. And my dad is also on. Hi, dad. So my dad, Patrick, I moved him down here from Northern California two years ago. Can you believe it? Or a year and a half ago. He lives in Spring Valley and he's in a great residential care facility there. I see him. We go out to dinner. We get to lunch and I'm going to go pop over there and see you today, dad. I have a couple things for you. Um, my dad wasn't around much when I was a kid. Um, he was an alcoholic, and he was in the military, and as soon as he uh, was discharged and came home, all of a sudden he had four girls, and it was just like, oh, and he just bolted, because he really he'd run his whole life from everything. And so um, I was nine when my parents officially got divorced, but they were only together about five of the 10 years that they were married, uh, together in the same house, because he was overseas in Korea and Vietnam. Um, so he was gone for most of my life up until I was an adult and um, I'll just tell real quick the story is that on Father's Day on Father's Day right after we got married so 89 I sat down and wrote my dad a letter I didn't know where he was but I had an address of somebody uh, a stepdaughter who lived across the street so I sent that registered mail to that address the day that I mailed it no yeah, I mailed it and he received it on the same day that he put a letter in the mail to me. So he put his letter in the mail and the mailman brought immediately my letter, which he had tried to write me over and over and over for years, but he, he always felt like he was such a failure and he didn't measure up. He was sober at this time. He'd gotten sober with his third wife um, through AA and he met God through AA and so grateful. But... Um, that was an immediate affirmation for him to say that I accepted him and I wanted a relationship with him. So years later, here we are, uh, 35 years later, almost, um, 34 years later, I've been able to develop a relationship with my dad. And dad, I would say the thing that I've learned from you is surrender. Um, you have surrendered so many things in your life and you, you just, give it to God. You really do, and you let it go, and I, I thank you for giving me that in my life. And the last father I want to talk about real quick before I turn the microphone over to him is my husband. Um, he has taught me so many things, but I would say probably the greatest thing is humility. Um, people balk at the fact that we don't fight. We just haven't. We've had some very heated debates and discussions, but we don't fight. And I think part of that is his example of humility um, and not having to be right, like choosing the relationship over having to be right has taught me how to do that too. I'm very assertive, strong-willed, and, 
I'm, this is the toned down version. This is the toned down version. We've been married almost 35 years. This is the toned down version of Anne. Uh, if you'd met me 35 years ago, Mark has a lot of patience too. Um, and I've learned from him and I've learned how to just acquiesce and not make, like pick your battles to, um, and to serve. To, if our goal is to outserve one another, we can't go wrong. And so I thank you for that, Mark. And I have, um, he is a keeper. <laughs> thank you. So I'm going to read something to you from your kids. Okay, this is from your oldest, Megan, who just turned 29, hard to believe. Okay, Dad, words cannot express my gratitude for all your love and care that you have given me as my father. You have been and still are an excellent role model for hard work, dedication, service, and humility, and corny humor. The old, <laughs> That's true. The older I get, the more grateful I am. Thank you for everything that you have done for me, my brother, and our whole family. Happy Father's Day. Love your daughter, Megan. Aww. And your new son-in-law of almost five years. They've been married almost five years. I know. Where does the time go? P. Mark, thank you for your years of wisdom and grace. I know we are not related. Well, except by marriage. But you're the closest thing I have to a father figure. Oh, I'm going to cry. You are a beacon of hard work and someone I look to when I need inspiration. Jesus Molo Molina. <laughs> and then your son. Hey, Dad. I've had a few moments recently where I've ended up telling someone I started drinking coffee at a really young age, about 10, from what I recall. <laughs> it's true. And I find it's funny when people are shocked to hear that, as most people start in high school or college. But I always tell them the reason I did was because I had a really cool dad who worked at Starbucks and raised me to enjoy the good stuff. <laughs> As I'm reflecting on this Father's Day, though, the ritual and enjoyment of coffee was not on the only thing you taught me. The cool, calm, and discreet way you do acts of service has truly shaped the way I think about giving. Through example, you've taught me to be observant and to keep an eye out for opportunities where I can give to others. It's been such a huge factor in the strong and amazing relationships I've built over the years and given me such a perspective on what it means to, be, to humble yourself and put others first. So today... Are you crying? <laughs> no, okay. So today, on Father's Day, I'm grateful for the way you've led by example in my life and helped guide me to be the person I am today. And I am very grateful that you're still part of my life and that we can still do things like hit the road for races. They ran the half marathon together, just like old times. Love you, Dad. Happy Father's Day. And one last thing before I, I turn the mic over to um, our guest poet. Um, I had this made for you. <laughs> Everybody's going to get a kick out of this. M you know, Mark, if he's either in the kitchen or the backyard working, he loves working with his hands. It says Mark's kitchen, Mark's rules. <laughs> so that's for you, my love. You can hang it up. And uh, when you say get out, we all have to get out of the kitchen. We always like to hang in the kitchen and talk. Okay. So, um, I'm very excited. Um, so Jim, I follow Jim's blog and I read his poetry that he puts out there. He's written two books and we got to go to his birthday party and he did this amazing reading. And then he's also read at Groovin in the Grove. And so this last poem he wrote, I was just, I, I read it to Mark because it was so good. And I said, but I probably don't read it as well as Jim because... Jim wrote it. He knows where the inflections go. And I said, Jim, I would love for you to come to our church and read this poem. And so he did, he's going to do that today. But also, he did something really special for us and wrote a poem for us here today. So come on up, Jim. Stand right between the stand and you'll be right. All right. So, like Ann said, um, I was inspired. I was inspired to write something. Um, first, I was just going to read a couple of poems I've already written in my for my books and things like that. And then I thought, wait a minute, I'm going to have to do a Substack anyway. Why don't I write a poem for Father's Day? So I was, it was Friday. We were here just visiting, and I said, Yeah, I'm going to write one. And I just knew it would come through because you know what? It always comes through. Just that surrender, like Anne was saying. 
So I wrote this yesterday for you all. And it's called Honoring Thy Father. The wonder of this relationship, born of mystery, father, dad, pops, in every step, our history. Though sometimes our father feels so far, far away, we have all been blessed on this very blessed day. On this 2024 Father's Day, we join in sacred communion, celebrating the miraculous, inevitable reunion. We, we come to commemorate what our fathers gave to us, a sense of stability, strength, guidance, and trust. Providing sustenance, a roof, protection, a boundary, a home. The sturdy foundation from which we could strike out on our own. Showing us, often in silence, a no problem, a no bother. Today, yes, we take a stand as we honor thy father. Now, sure, in the past, there was constant prodding, chiding, and pokes, and those, oh my gosh, so cringeworthy, agitating dad jokes. Relentless plays on words and goofy statements that made little sense. He helped us build the bridge, the go-kart, the fort, the fence. Even for those who departed or were absent or have fallen away in death, we came to grow through the pain, through each and every breath. Like many mysterious stories, the lessons came with the blame. After attempts to distance ourselves, we still now call his name. Secretly, beyond any upset, we long to be your son or your daughter. And then thankfully, we take a stand as we honor thy father. Here, no matter how far we have traveled down the road, here at Cornerstone Community Church of Lemon Grove, with David Leon, Scott Gray on AV, and Lee Logue, a father of three, and Tito and Ariana Liv, who may be now watching on their TV. Then, of course, Pastor Mark, who will always be there to lend a hand. And then Patrick Cady, one of his four daughters, our dear Anne. Now, in the final view here, we come to honor him today. Now, which father do I reflect upon in this way? He who can never betray us. He who is the Almighty One. He who sent this glorious gift of his only begotten son. The heavenly father, of course, though at times seemingly absentee. The father who only wants us to return home and to be free. Lord, though sometimes we wonder if you are even there. Do you know me? Do you see me? Do you hear me? Do you care? Indeed, the work of your hand, we the clay and you the potter, as we come to honor and praise and glorify the one and only Father, today, yes, we take a stand, graciously honoring thy Father. So I'm going to do the, thank you, I'm going to do the poem that uh, Anne mentioned that I had read at my birthday party, and she says, oh, you have to read that, and I actually made an audio for her, and I sent it to her. So instead of the audio, instead of, uh, I will read this directly to you, it's called Diving Into Faith. Faith, I want to dive into faith, into the cool blue water that embraces me like a womb, safe. Assured, peaceful, restful, originating all from faith. Faith, that link to something higher, 
pure like cool blue water beyond the fear beyond the stress beyond the doubt that dreaded doubt that would laugh at my failures even the most minute of mishaps exclaiming this is the real you this is how it will continue this has just begun those terror remarks that rattle my sense of self and implode my inner core like strategically placed detonations in old creaky building. Blueprints with plans to ruin me at every turn. If not for, if not for faith, the knowing that these shadows are temporary only existing because some fiend has blocked the sun for a moment. Faith, the keen and clear awareness that the sun does assuredly exist behind all shadows. The sun, the source, the source of heat, warmth, and life, creating a glimmering reflection of the cool blue water forever. No matter the frightful remarks from a mind bent on destruction, forever, in faith, in life, in life, that which exists in every breath into lungs, filling and emptying, filling and emptying, when observed, taking us infinitely deeper into the truth that will free us to love, to faith, to faith. Yeah. <laughs>